Thank you. Yeah. So I guess um, we can start. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the special event with Elizabeth Tom Martin, Resource and Development Manager, and Fernando Artigas, Director of Design and Site Construction from Roth Architecture. We are more than 200 participants internationally. I would like to welcome all of you and thank you, Ms. Elizabeth and Mr. Fernando for your collaboration. Um, Ms. Elizabeth and Mr. Fernando will explain the process behind Roth Architecture's unique and innovative projects and explaining the connection between nature and human. Then we will move on to the question session. I would like to leave the floor to our special guests, Mr. Ms. Elizabeth and Mr. Fernando. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you guys. Okay, so we will uh, put in the screen our presentation so you can uh, start to see. Over here, just a quick brief. We will uh, give a brief introduction of who we are, who is the, the mind master behind this creative uh, space and firm. And we will uh, share with you a few program uh, projects uh, that we did that you can see uh, our work on, on social media. Um, yeah. Now. This one. Okay, so we're going to start at the beginning um, and we've broken down our introduction into our foundation and the pillars of design that we really believe in, um, as well as a little bit of background on our team and some background on the founder, Roth. Um, but let's start with the foundation first. So right now, as I'm sure all of you are very, very aware. We're at a critical um, juncture in the point of architecture and how it merges with the natural environment. And our ecosystems globally are under tremendous, tremendous strain. And fundamentally, we come at these projects and we arrive at these projects uh, believing that architecture has a critical responsibility in the future of our earth and in the future of our natural environments that directly impacts our well-being. We build to unite. We want to unite not just um, people with people, but also bring people to nature and bring nature to people. And so in a lot of our structures and spaces, um, we actively engage with the natural surroundings and we allow trees to grow within our spaces. We hope not to cut anything down. So a lot of what you'll see in the picture is to come show that. Um, we're actively looking at each, uh, each site and analyzing it more from the perspective of almost a naturalist or preservationist and wanting to have a really minimal impact on that space. Um, and we especially want to push uh, the dichotomy that we see between interior and exterior spaces and try to redefine what this means. A lot of times we're trying to build walls to keep the outside out and the inside in. And this architecture doesn't do this. This architecture is a blend. The three axes that uh, support um, our creations are nature, art, and ancestry. Um, we look towards history, we look towards ancestry and our past and our roots and honor primary architecture and believe that fundamentally working with a local material palette uh, can act as an extension of the earth. We can build directly with the earth and from the earth and in that way honor her. Um, and we seek to help people to open up the realms of possibility within their understanding of what we can do creatively and through architectural design through these spaces. This is a picture that, of a space that we're going to return back to. Um, this is one of our museum spaces, but you can see a first peek at all of the trees and the light that we like to pull in. Okay. 
Okay, so who, who is the mind master at the back of this? Like, his name is Rod. Uh, he's the one that brought the, this act that uh, Liz just explained, the three pillars of, uh, of the whole company. And he's a really an, a amazing person, entrepreneur guy that he's really searching to unite, as Liz explained, uh, the philosophy of the old cultures within the idea of the art and the nature to progress and to give a, a way more strong meaning to the foundations for the future generations. Uh, we've been working with him along this uh, project and it's interesting to, to share with him because from the beginning he started to seek how to, to achieve, to, to gain strength with more persons and, and, and be able to share it so more people understand and, and get together with us in this team. Uh, so through this work we've been doing with him and, and sharing because he's always sharing new ideas. He ha he's a really visionary guy. All the time he has a new idea that uh, you think you already know what is going to happen and then he just came with, uh, comes down with a new idea with us and explain us um, a different perspective that uh, us an archi as ar architects that study architecture, sometimes we have limits uh, shown by the structure of the, of the schools that put us to think that architecture should be like this. But sometimes when you start to think uh, out of being an architect or an artist uh, or an engineer, you start to, to see things uh, in a different perspective that can enlighten growth the any, any uh, project. So our team has been growing over the years. Um, the first project that we're going to show you that Fernando is going to talk through is um, the hotel. And when we started to build that project, Roth Architecture actually didn't exist. Um, the idea was Azubi was the hotel. And that was the design inspiration um, and the, the goal. Um, and the team kind of built around that to start. And then over the years has progressed and developed. Azure Week was completed in 2014. And we've gone through many different iterations of the team. But right now we have 22 amazing and diverse staff members here that offer a huge amount of skill set. And this is just within the architecture team. But if we're looking at the full breakdown of the company, uh, we have many different workshops. And the workshops are split in between fashion and gastronomy and macrame or textile arts weaving. Uh, we also have an entire department that focuses on music production and offering events. Uh, we have a video and cinematography team, a glass and sculpture team, as you can see, uh, just to add in over here, is we are, it, it's not only architecture. Uh, if you think as an architect, we are delivering only something that will give for a client and that's it. But over there is where we feel, uh, and Rod specifically it was thinking that it's, it's not completed the, the, the projects. It has to be a multidisciplinary space. So we are a multidisciplinary firm that when we think in architecture, we go and speak with the fashion designers to, how, to see how they arrive and think the space, how they want to fill it with the, with the textures they, they, they see. Us, as architects, we normally don't think about it. Or we go with the musicians and the musicians feel the music and they give input to the projects that normally, as an architect, if you're not specialized in acoustic, you won't pay attention to that. And that in every single part of, of our company. So it's really interesting to now in these days, as an architect, understand and see that if we think on, uh, on our own side, then the projects are a lack of having a really strong heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Completely, yeah. The furniture and interior design and ceramics team and model fabrication team also play a really big role. And if we're looking in total um, at everyone here on site, it 
far expands beyond the 22 people that we have right here in this office space here with us right now. Our headquarters are in the jungle uh, of, of, um, of the Mayan jungle, 22 kilometers from the beach of, the, of Tulum. That means that we're in the middle of, uh, of the jungle and um, all the crews here, we're around 120, 130 persons of different disciplines co-working for all the projects that we do. It doesn't matter the, the mind, as I already explained. Sometimes ceramic people come to help us, to give us uh, observations when we are thinking in prefabs because they know how to do it. And uh, so, so go on on the projects we do. The presentation that we will show uh, to you now, it's kind of a timeline that we see that is called, um, we call it evolution, that it goes from the origins, that is the Hotel Azulik, then the present, that is the, our headquarters, our office that we have, we will pass through a construction images to share with you a little bit of our system that we, that we did here that help us to do more, uh, to stick more with the forms of organic uh, elements. And then we go to the materiality where you will see what ma local materials we are using that help us to respect the forms that we like to do. Okay, should, should we play the, the video? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna start this project showing you all um, a video that was created for a handful of different purposes, but it gives you a sense of what it feels like to actually be in the hotel, to be in Azulik. Um, and it also gives you some beautiful aerial shots <laughs> so you can see it from above. Okay, so we hope you enjoy the video, guys, and uh, and give you some inspiration. Um, the idea to share with you uh, that video is to explain a little bit how we, as you can see, how we become part of the environment, of the context. No, so 
the jo the hotel it's in in Tulum in in front of the beach and on top of a risk so over there is where Roth decide to get advantage of this opportunity instead of having a, a trouble because normally people want to come and be in the beach in the sand but over here is where he saw an opportunity it's something that he's always reminding us that every challenge we find it's a good opportunity to get outside of our normal way of thinking to to seek solutions um, that might take us to see things in a different perspective. So this opportunity took him to put uh, Asolik on the hair of the on on the highest uh, point in at least in, in um, Instagram, as you know. We, uh, three, four months ago, we were named the first hotel with uh, most, uh, most seen in the world, a uh, photographed hotel in the world. So the hotel, it, it sticks and uh, to respect the, the nature and become part of it using local materials. The hotel is primary, I could say 90% out of wood using local technique, Mayan technique to do uh, this type of roofs that is with, uh, with plants that grow in this area. You want to say something over here? Nighttime views are especially beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> what we can see over here, it's a pure creativity that can, can lead us to see boundaries and to break them. So for example, these images that, that you can see now, it's part of the hotel, different parts of it. Uh, the middle one is the one that I love to, to share. As you can see, it's a space with double height and it has a net, but this net, it was not put in over there to enjoy. To, to enjoy. The primary uh, focus of this was to not to put a rail for safety. Because if there is a double height space, you can see the stairwell over here. If we were going to put a, a, a rail around it, so people don't fall down, it will break the view. But when you arrive to a place and you don't have a rail, you feel that the floor continues, you, you don't feel safe. But with this net, you know that you're not going to fall down. So you don't feel that, um, that uh, friend, you don't feel afraid of walking through and it comes to become a part where people love to sit down and enjoy the perspective and enjoy the view of the jungle. So this makes it the place to feel that you're more, more in a jungle house and more, more around and more becoming part of the architecture. So you're not just passing through it, you're being part with it. You're starting to, to get in, uh, surrounded. Why a roof has to be only a roof? Why we cannot put a high place to have a beautiful view of the space? So over here we do it. Again, if we do a normal rail, it will break the, the, the design of the place. So let's be clever about how we use the local materials. It's all about creativity, to be pushing us always to the limit of what we feel it's, it's going to be the next one. Over here in the, in the right side, upper level of the screen, you will see something that uh, we call our nests. These nests are beautiful to have a dinner because you see all the sky as Liz uh, said in the last uh, image, because they're not, we're in the small town, so we're, we don't have too much light, so we can enjoy the sky. So this is a really rad space to see. And in the lower level, we see our entrance to, Asul, to Sac Ik, that is our retail store. That is, as well over there, Roth uh, break a few um, lines uh, of how normal people, normal world would think how retail should be shown. And over here, Roth uh, show um, how we can create new spaces. And we have won a few prizes with this retail store. This is another part of the hotel uh, that is uh, um, called uh, the painter uh, space. Um, that on top of it, we have people that go over there at uh, night to have a nice view of, of the sunset um, in the jungle. 
And as well, in the lower part of the image, you can see these bridges that are going through. Normally, you will see, like, you would think about walking through the floor to go into places. But when you start to change the, the perspective of how you want to, to live and feel in the space, uh, you start to see more possibilities and it's just to find us a, a technical solution to do it. It's, it's all about uh, understanding what you want to feel, what you want the user or the person that is going to leave your project to feel more than what you want to, sh to do for them. It's to feel. Over here we see the dome uh, for doing yoga. You can see the beautiful shapes, how are done. This is all done with local people. This is not, this is not done with uh, engineers. This was not uh, designed and done in plans before construction. It was straight in place. Yeah, that's something that we should touch on for a minute, just because I think yeah. in school, we're so used to working through a project, developing a concept, um, uh, creating a really, really detailed digital model, right? And we're very used to this as like a process that we have to go through. But this first project had very, very little in terms of drawings. It was felt, like the architecture was truly felt and created on the spot. Um, we work in an area where we're very fortunate to be yeah. able to do this. Yes. This doesn't always happen with architecture. And it's one of the reasons that makes Tulum and this area, Umai, so special. Um, we can play and we can actively be creating our architecture and manipulating, modifying as we think it's needed on the spot. We don't necessarily need to create um, a new CD set to get signed off on. We don't need another permit. And so there's a genuine difference um, in terms of how we're building. This is one image that shows the retail store. Uh, Sakik. As you can see, normally someone would think uh, in a retail store you cannot put water. How, why you're going to put water inside a store? Over here, Rob said like, okay, this is a really cool way that people can continue feeling that they're inside of the jungle and they can explore. And it's important to understand that um, through discovering the spaces, you are actively working with you to be present your your brain your mind stop to talk to you because you you are being aware that you're getting in a place that you need to understand it so you become present and that is a more the most important thing that we need to understand at least in our perspective and on my perspective of, of life is what we need to do is to be more present and being present everything comes easy to you even the solutions, the designs, everything comes like that. So over here, you can see those small steps that are to walk through. Every, everything that we design is barefoot. All you, want, you arrive to the hotel, you're going to get inside of the gallery or the museum, and they ask you to get your, your shoes off and your socks. Within the idea is not to take care of the floor because we don't want to get uh, dirty. It's because we want the users to feel to get root through the feet with the nature and the place. Over here you say like maybe if, if you are uh, walking in concrete, yeah, you're walking in concrete, but you feel the temperature. You become present through the sensations. Over here we can see an image that how this part of the hotel, we're trying to give unity with the view of the sea, with the comfort of the people in the, in the jacuzzi. And of, of course, all of us, we still have a child inside. Why an adult cannot play and sit down in a, um, um, how is it called, sorry? Um, in a swing. In a swing to enjoy the view and just enjoy where they are and feel the wind. Yeah. It's something that we all enjoy. So it's where we like to push as well in our designs to continuously take out the kid of every adult that gets in any place. <laughs> it's important. We connect again with our own uh, inner lights. This is one of our, of our villas in the hotel. And this is a very, very beautiful, unique piece that you can see. This tub is uh, in the middle of the room. You will see in the next photo a little bit more and um, wide open image. 
or this one of the detail, you can see how this window is getting the light inside. You're, you're having your bath here uh, and you're enjoying plants that are inside of your room. You're part of it. It's what Liz was explaining in the beginning. Let's break the line uh, that what is outside and what is inside. Why we want to take nature off and why we don't um, understand that we come from her. So let's be part with her. This is a whole room. You can see how it magical it is and how you feel that you're host and you're um, hugged by the place. This is a shower that we were watching. All the floor is made of, uh, made of uh, local vine that is called bejuco. That vine, you, we use it in a lot of things because it becomes part of our nature. Uh, we use it and eventually, in a few parts, it starts to grow again and it becomes a natural life part. Like in the painter, um, in the painter um, tower that I show you, that the nature is coming back alive and getting it uh, around, surrounded by leaves. We're passing by, we're passing now to the chapter of the present. And that is where we start to build our, um, our headquarters. This is a view of the sky in the jungle. And this form, organic form that you see over here, it's, a, it's, a, it's an element made of concrete, but you can see how beautiful it's woven and the forms are done. When we speak, uh, organic architecture, that doesn't mean that needs to stick to be natural materials. We're talking about the forms, the shapes. What happens when you see nature? Your eye goes totally with it and it starts to move around with what you see because of the shapes. If we see and think in the normal technical constructive systems that we see now in the, in the, in the industry, they are all straight and they are all in a perfect format because it's easy to produce and to sell and to, and to construct, uh, to make construction, of course. But it has a lack of sensation, of sensitivity when you're inside of them because you have these corners that, that the energy is stuck over there. When you see an organic form, it flows with you. Do you want to continue with me over here? Sure, yeah. Uh, we're going to jump just very briefly because I know we're, uh, we're focusing a lot on Azulik and on the residents that we have here on site, but we're going to talk briefly about the two museums uh, that we have as well because they're very important parts of our process and of our history. And the first one that we're going to touch on is Sferik in Tulum. And this museum is directly connected to the hotel, which is special for the hotel guests. They can pop over and visit but it's completely open to the public. Um, we have visitors coming in frequently. And again, in terms of materiality and function, we can see a lot of play coming into all of the design. We like to weave with the trees that are on site and that are there already, and then pull in the palette that Fernando has already been referencing. Um, we work a lot with Bahuka with a natural vine that grows here abundantly in this region. Um, we work, yeah, in terms of the floors, he's pointing now to the floors. The pieces can range in size and in shape, but in terms of their workability, uh, we like to have our, our artisans and our construction teams really weave with them and play with the pattern and play with um, their imagination and their own creativity and how they can see the space, which becomes quite special. One of our early uh, drawings that Fernando here did. <laughs> well, the team. So the team, the team put together. Um, and this is showing the cross section of that space. This isn't a huge museum per se, but it's deep enough to really get into. And from a photographing perspective, it is quite phenomenal in terms of how the team designed the light to puncture through the various openings in the wall. And it does have a continuous circulation path that you move up and that you move down. So the view is constantly changing. 
adding adding over here you can see this this is after the construction this was not done before and then you can see the line we like to respect the topography of the place it doesn't matter if the if the floor is is wobbly a little bit uh, we like to respect it so as well you are present when you are walking because in my perspective you have to be aware of what is happening otherwise you might fall you know? and um, as Liz was saying this lets us to have a nice uh, different view all the time you never having the same angle that bridge that Liz was saying is the one that we can see in the, in the photo of the middle and all the time you're having a different perspective you can see how the, the trees are getting around here how they are crossing the building or they are even blowing inside nature is shockingly amazing how she adapts or it adapts to the place if you put ac in a jungle after a few months on uh, it understands how to live with it and you can see how it's blowing this trunk that was fallen uh, but we really, uh, decide to leave it and it goes off the building and it starts to blossom inside this is another shot of the of Sreik Tulum, where you can see the vines of Bejuco that Liz was explaining and, it, and how it starts to have a design through the concrete, how the forms are doing this table and the light uh, that, that is getting through the windows. You know, all this done by local people. And then we're jumping into Sparikou Mai. Uh, so as Fer mentioned, Obviously, the hotel is in Tulum. That's super important. We have our offices and our full team um, for design and development is here in Francisco Umay, which is around 30 minutes into the jungle from Tulum. So it's a very different environment. We don't necessarily have the coastal aspect per se. Um, we're deep in the jungle and we genuinely embrace that. And the Spheric Museum here is a whole lot bigger. When, when the team uh, started this process of construction, we're gonna show you some of the construction photos in a little bit, um, but when they started it, they did a really big analysis of the site and of course analyzed where the trees were and where they wanted their primary features to be. Oops. Just, sorry, just to add over here, um, uh, with this project, we've won uh, a few prizes already. Uh, we put them over here. Uh, the Architecture Awards, the LSBD, that is a really important uh, in uh, category uh, talking in museums. Uh, and uh, well, it's shockingly because this was done without plans and without uh, any uh, plan or, or, or management. It was done on site within the idea that Ross was walking and with the team of, of construction, we were leading to ground ideas. How you can see over here, how this tree, uh, funny situation, this was the only space that didn't have trees. And it was where Roth said like, oh, we don't have trees over here. We needed to plant a tree that goes out of the building because it's not, easy, it's not nice to have a place that doesn't have a tree. Um, this shape that you see in this photo, you can see how it's starting to turn around and it's a continuity in this photo that it goes around from becoming a table to go and become part of the wall that is at the back. Just to put in context. These drones, these drawings are done after um, the, the construction was ended. That gives kind of a sensation how we have a dome these are 700 square meters, all this main area. It has 14, uh, almost 15 meters height. You normally enter to the museum in, a, um, in the middle level, around six meters height, you get into the museum. Again, normally you ask these questions. Why you always have to get in uh, through the ground level? Why we cannot get up the people and get them inside of the building in the second or third level who says that that's the, the way over here is where we express what we feel it's needed for for the benefit of our project of our creation that we want to share 
This image is a, is a, a photo taken from the upper level to the ground. You can see with that human scale, uh, the proportion of the space. And all these plants that you see were, uh, were put in, in the bridge around, the, uh, around the, the, the bridge. And they were small when we, when we end up the museum. And now this is the height that they're going to the floor. So we're talking that the, this type of plant has adapted and enjoy the place, like this tree that is in the middle. Another Sorry. shot of some of our curving, <laughs> curving circulation paths moving around. Again, everything that you see was constructed on site, um, very actively, active level of design work here. And another shot looking forward at some of the seating areas and the floor. The floor, something that I just thought of actually on the spot as we're talking through these is that we don't see floor as floor and wall as wall and ceiling as ceiling. Yes. It's truly a continuity of spaces and they blend together. They, I know we've used the word weaving a lot, but all of the different elements that we're utilizing to build are truly actively woven together and the entire piece when you're looking at it when you see it in the frame and when you see it in real life and feel it yeah and Same. when you feel it you see it as a work of art it stops being enclosure it stops being building as we understand it and it feels like a living breathing piece of art that happens to you know hug you yeah, yeah. it's a weaving architecture yeah oh. Again, over here, you can see like talking in, in this about this image, it's like these are not, a, these are not uh, trees, these are columns mm -hmm. that uh, we decide to put them using the local materials instead of building them within the idea of blending with the natural trees that are around in the, in the site. Mm -hmm. Walls to divide the space, to create small spaces for the museum, so you can have different uh, uh, um, uh, rooms. Again, why, why a wall, wall has to be straight? Yeah. Why it has to be just in one, in one axis? Why it cannot be in different ones? As you can see how this wall is going up and then it's going down and you start to play with it and enjoy it. We have many different um, installations and different exhibitions of different artists that come through both museums. That should absolutely be highlighted for a moment. Uh, but on the right, you can see one of the installations of these beautiful suspended woven structures, again with the weaving. This image on the right is actually quite powerful because of the detail on the bottom. We can see one of the floor plates <laughs> coming up, wrapping up, and we still allow the tree uh, to be held, to be pocketed, and through lighting techniques, we're highlighting that base. Um, and we're also allowing some light to come down onto the roots and onto the leaves. And then on the left, something special that I know Fernando definitely wanted to touch on is that we yes. don't need to be thinking um, straight column, straight beam. We can play with that. That's an area to play and explore and embrace a more sculptural approach. So these, the forms that you see aren't necessarily just decorative. In a lot of instances, they're not decorative at all. They're actually very structural. And that's one of the big benefits of working um, with ferrocementitious material, of being able to, uh, to wrap with it, to curve it, and to utilize this as a material that can be architectural, but it, but it can also be structural and sculptural yes. simultaneously. It has these various different functions that are important to us for many reasons. Yeah. yeah. Specific on, on it, it's really it's good that you said that because it's, a, a, it's really important. As you can see, this is a column as well as this one. And the other one that you see at the back over here is as well a column. And what this beautiful element, element is doing is wrapping them all together to create a beam to solidify the structure of this bridge. So when you're down and you're watching all the trees that are growing, the columns 
mimetize and become part of it. So when you see the bridge of concrete, it's so light, you don't even think it's done by concrete because of the columns and the way how we build the structure. We're getting into Umay residence where you can see how uh, as well the, the shapes are, are making the space. Um, this is a photo of uh, one of the bathrooms and this is the, the beautiful window with a hot tub that is inside of a hole, natural hole that we found in the place. So instead of putting something in and tapping and closing it and creating a top on top of it, it was like, hey, it's pretty interesting. Why do we don't get inside of that hole and have a top over there? Yeah. Hey, that sounds a good <laughs> idea. And then we do it like that, you know, it's through intuition, how you feel the place again. It's about sensations. And with a huge window. <laughs> totally. So you can enjoy the view of nature, no? You're inside of a place, but you see all the natural elements that you are in the middle of the jungle. This house, as you can see, it's totally surrounded uh, by plants and inside of it, it has around 200 trees living that go out of the tree. It was pretty interesting to get into that uh, situation to be able to find um, the solutions so it doesn't get the water inside. And if the water gets inside, how we are gonna take it to go outside or get it into the ground where we need, uh, where it's not gonna uh, mess up with the with the space interior. It's important to understand this. Normally, as our, as architects and especially the ones that construct or or will want to go in the path of construction, normally you see the water as an enemy because you're always trying to avoid it. But over here, instead of finding a solution to stop it, let's flow with it and use it in the benefit. These are some images in the, uh, the interior of the house uh, that you can see. All this, again, is done with the, our multidisciplinary space and, and team. We have macrame, that is a type of, of knots, a local knots that they use. And, and we have a, a department um, full of people that are doing all these techniques, beautiful uh, techniques. Uh, we have the fashion department that uh, they design uh, even do the colors of the of the cushions and the textiles with natural fibers and and colors of 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 plants that come out of our kitchen. So we are truly searching to be sustainable in every corner and to use everything that comes off of uh, of the place. So we're going to get into the specifics of this space. Um, the residence uh, was designed by and for Roth and has all of these different elements within it that were important to him as you know client of this space. It should be noted that Roth lives in this house, so it's actively lived in. Um, it's not just uh you know a space that we have here on site for viewing per se um it's actively utilized which makes it doubly triply special yes yeah one of our beds we like to play with different ways to um embrace sleeping yeah. <laughs> and rest, rest and enjoy and enjoy the place like every corner when 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 we design and uh, it's important uh, to share with you guys is to enjoy the place that we're designing. Yeah. Every corner, as you can see in the image that we're sharing, we're showing how every corner is a place to sit down in the floor and, and relax mm -hmm. and meditate and enjoy the place. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, where, where Liz is pointing the mouse, that is a library that Roth was willing to say like, why we have to put books in the, in the, in the walls? That will mess the, beauty, the beautiful of the, uh, part of the house. Let's put them on the floor. Yeah. It's, it was kind of a weird uh, uh, requisition, <laughs> but after a while of pushing it further, we found out the solution and it's pretty unique and beautiful way to express the books because when you arrive walking, you see all the books shown in the place. You see directly, you don't, you're not walk, uh, watching them on the wall and, see, and seeking which one you, you want to see. You have them on the floor with a kind of a slope that it's able that you can see 
the other ones, no? And again, we can see a lot of play in terms of the floor leading into the wall, um, the trees coming in and out, the entire space feeling like a composition, more of an artistic composition. This is one of the part of the house that is called the, the music uh, room. This wall is all made of a huko within the idea of the acoustic to be able to, to control the, um, the, um, the sound because of the organic shapes. We can see how this tree is coming on. And normally when you're thinking about a place and design a place with double height, we never use the height or well, not never. Sometimes you do a mezzanine or or a second sub-level to use the other part. Over here, we like to use it and we did this space with a net. So you can enjoy as well. You go on top of a stairwell, you go through this path and go again into this stairwell and then you go to the net to just relax, enjoy and feel, listen the music from the top, uh, from the roof uh, when they're playing down, no? Now we're going out in the exterior of the house. This is the dining room that is blended, as Liz explained in the beginning, interior exterior. Yeah, this part is incredibly special, Same. at least for me. Uh, when I first visited the site for my first time, I was really struck by this space. And frequently um, we'll have visitors who are wandering through, enjoying it. They can also eat here with us. They can dine at the restaurant and get a taste of some of our cuisine. In these images of the outside, a lot of what you see are these uh, kind of like pockets, like little mm -hmm. jackets for the mm -hmm. trees coming up. So yeah. yet again, you know, we're not in an interior space, but yet again, we're seeing the incorporation and the treatment and the respect for nature and then the interweavings of these cement pathways moving through. And you can also get a taste for what it's like to be here in the jungle with us yeah. and all of the nature that we have surrounding us. This is one image to show kind of the, the achievements uh, as a structural um, um, element. This is a, in a spiral this is a lower level and it's going up high till 12 meters. This is a wall of around uh, 15, uh, 15 centimeters uh, thick with 12 <laughs> meters height, showing that it's, it's how you create the structure of your wall to be able to whip, to be able to uh, down, uh, to ground the loads. It's about whipping. You can see a little bit, that image was a skylight image. Now this one is a little bit shown in a long distance. You can see how this shape is done. All these small lines that you see is fiber optic within the idea that at night when, the, when, when we light them up and the wind is blowing, you see like this small, um, um, how, what's the name of the? A glistening, a glowing. Yeah. Or sparkling. Sparkling <laughs> lights. Yeah, and a night view of that night, same space. Night view of that same space to show how we can create atmospheres as well through light. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting to, to think about it. How, look, how magical it looks. It's the same volume, the same place, two different colors, and it gives perspective, uh, depth, and uh, texture. You can see how big it is in concrete, but it blends with nature. Now we're passing to the last chapter and um, we're trying to do it a little bit faster uh, because we like, we, we love our work so we get a little bit deep into it. <laughs> this chapter will show a little bit of the process of, uh, of constructive uh, elements in this place. As you can see, you can see the weaving technique at the back and how the concrete is done and applied over here. Now these holes that you see are the, the holes of the beams of the structure that was put in so the workers can go higher in the, in the building. When we took them out, this is the beautiful part of organic construction. When we took them off, we saw all these holes and this light was so nice that we decided to leave them and not cover them. If you think that you have a project 
you won't have these opportunities because you design it in the computer and you're going to build it how it was done. But having this opportunity of, of watching these videos, it changed totally how, the, how you feel and see the sensations and the light in the place. This is a site construction photo uh, shown of how we are starting to create the form. Our system, a uh, constructive system, I, I think we should share the video of construction. Yeah. What I think. Yeah. Let me do that first. And then we have some beautiful photos of scaffolding and, <laughs> and reinforcements for you. Yeah. So, and definitely cut us off, Mire, if we're um, if we're running over time. Can you see? The no, it's totally up to you. You can exceed the time. Also. Oh, okay. 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 So this video is to share with you guys. This is a small project that we did here on site, and um, I'm, I'm gonna speed up a little bit some parts just to make it a little bit quick. But this shows our process. Our process of construction starts with modeling one-on-one -on -one scale with PVC pipes. That means that we do a shape one-on-one -on -one so we can see and feel it. We get inside of it, we see how it looks and we create changes on site. And after that, we start to replace the, the, the pipes, the PVC pipes with the rebars if it is that element, uh, if it is that uh, system, constructive system, we're going to use it. If it is another one, we use another system. Mm -hmm. We start to replace them and then we put a whip, uh, um, a mesh after putting the concrete. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, poured on site, it's done by hand. All our work is craft made. That's why you can see how, how it has love in every corner. <laughs> Over there, we're, we are starting to mix. Uh, we're starting to respect the spaces of the roots of the trees and finding where we can uh, put our foundation. Over here, you see the pipes, how we're putting them to start to create the shape and the form. And the crew is starting to give the forms. The forms are lit through feelings, through feeling them and watching them. Then after we decide that the structure and the design is properly, we start to put the mesh. You see how the workers are assembling it and putting this uh, wire to be able to, to put the, to apply the concrete to glue it as how you see these guys are doing it. We use as well a lot of wood in different elements. All this wood comes from, uh, uh, from places that are allowed to, to cut the trees because of the growth. This timeline shows the forms. This is our ceramic shop that we built. Uh, we end up with uh, at, the, at the beginning of this year. Even the, um, the um, iron, the doors, we do them because of the shapes. We just, you can see our windows, our, our forms. So we need to do on site our doors because they are not normal walls. It's labor intensive and it's highly creative. Um, our construction teams are incredibly well skilled and they range in terms of the diversity of their experience and their skill sets. Uh, we have an entire team that is very well versed in woodworking and uh, both framing and finished carpentry. We have a team that's very well versed in all different types of concrete, there are cement applications, plastering. Um, we have another team that's very well versed in their steel work and all their metal work, glass installation. Um, yeah, you name it, you name it, we can build it. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's special and it's unique, uh, highly unique. And it makes for, again, like an environment that's very dynamic. Um, if we want to make a change, we can actively make a change on the spot. If Roth or Fernando or any one of our leaders in the construction team is walking through and they think that something doesn't fit, that something doesn't feel quite right, we can modify it, we can change it, um, especially here in Umay on this site. 
Continuing with the, with sharing the forms, how we do them. These photos are of our headquarters. Um, you can see how the still we are blending it to create the forms and the shapes. It's only a little, it's a small trigger in our brains, guys, that when you understand that you can design and build not straight <laughs> and you can leave the place and enjoy it, then your brain starts to design and to create spaces as how I see with more taste. Yeah. And um, it's, it's pretty beautiful how you, you feel inside of these places because you see the photos, but for understanding this type of architecture, you need to feel it. It does change totally uh, the photos. And if at some point in your life, guys, you are able to come, you're, you're all welcome and you will understand what we're talking about. And if not with us, if you go to another project in, in different place in the world that is in a different constructive system, you will understand through sensations, not through our eye. Our eye understands and see and process, but you need to feel it. No? Yeah. You see the shape, how it's on, how we uh, put uh, some uh, take care of the trees here, and then all these become part again of nature, how they are going out of the building. In every corner, you can see how they are round. No? Now talking about materiality, this is these are the, the local vines that we use and uh, that we, we put them when they are green to be able to put the forms and the shapes. Um, after they get uh, dry, some of them um, stick with the form and other ones start to blossom depending on the strength of each one of the vines. Bahuko is one of our primary ingredients here that we work with. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, it, com it grows in different thicknesses, different uh, diameters. Some of them are very, very tiny. Um, in like where you might see a uh, typical joinery, we're trying to uh, re-envision that. Um, not necessarily fully reinvent, but iterate and build upon what we're used to seeing in the industry in the hopes of creating uh, furniture and interior pieces that are completely blended. We're showing here a little bit of our glass studio simply because we've had so many fantastic, um, uh, like true explorations, true developments with that team where uh, we've been working through processes of blending various materials, whether uh, they be pigments or types of glass um, or granular pieces into the mixture. And then we've been developing different form works. So within our furniture palette, uh, we aren't just producing uh, chairs or benches or tables per se, but we're also looking at our fixtures and the different finishes that we can be using in all of the spaces. Um, even in our bathrooms, I think the one thing that we haven't gotten to designing yet at this point is toilets, but yeah. perhaps <laughs> in the future we'll have a line of um, Roth architecture, Azulik-esque yeah. uh, toilet features that we can all be using. Um, <laughs> but even with uh, like knobs, uh, things that are that your hand is touching and grabbing. Uh, like, we like to sorry, play just, with that. Yeah. For, for, for some instance, an example, um, creating a, a light, a light, lightning lamp. Yeah. Uh, this is an exploration that we did with blown glass and natural elements. You don't find them on, on the market, but we went with a shop of blown glass and started to explore putting different textures. It's about exploration and seeking something that breaks down the normal common view of the market, mm -hmm. no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then again, just a couple more shots kind of highlighting the different woodwork um, that we like to do in our macrame. You can actually see on the left a little bit of what I was just talking to, um, where if you enter uh, a bathroom space, it doesn't just necessarily need to feel like um, like a typical business as usual type of space, but it can still blend in and uh, feel inspirational and fluid and creative. 
Um, in the middle, you're seeing a lot of our bahuco and our macrame, our textile work, and then the textiles all the way on the side. Um, but in terms of uh, process of construction and materiality, we like to recycle as much as we can, um, especially with our formworks, any of our scaffolding, any of the early formwork development, we're putting that in place and then reutilizing it, which is great. And at the moment, what we're focusing on a lot here in-house is the development of alternative materials that we can be utilizing um, to substitute out our standard business as usual synthetics um, that we see in the industry so frequently. Um, something that we haven't touched on yet, but might be good, like a good note to end on, is that a lot of our intention with these structures and spaces uh, is to uh, create spaces that have absolutely an immediate function, but they act as living spaces. Yes. And in that way, we, we as architects and as builders are actually actively engaged in the process of maintaining those spaces. And that's super unique for yeah. our company and it differentiates us and it begs the question, do, you know, should we be going towards a more permanent architecture that exists forever and ever and ever? Or are we collectively moving to towards an architecture um, that's more temporary? Uh, perhaps it's biodegradable. Perhaps it changes over time and it can really, um, it can modify, it can expand, contract, uh, be manipulated and, you know, needs love and care and attention to exist. And in one moment it might exist and in one moment it might not. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah with this we end up uh, our presentation guys and uh, thanks for, on, uh, for your time for listening, being here with us. And now if you, anyone has any questions or uh, you want to pop up, we're open to, to help you to give answers. Uh, thank you very much, dear Elizabeth and Fernando for this uh, very nice and detailed presentation. Uh, it was really full of information and uh, I hope we can with this unit project as soon as possible. So now uh, we, will, we will move on with the Q&A session and the participants who want to ask a question can use the raise hand button on the participant section and can ask their questions or we can direct direct your questions on chat and we can read them. Uh, however, in order to have a more interactive session, uh, we prefer you to unmute yourself and ask your questions directly. We can wait a little bit for the attendees. Mm -hmm. It's impressive to see this number of people here. It's exciting for us. Yes. Yeah. It seems the show has a question. We can ask your question, so. <laughs> so. Can you hear us? Oh, I, I couldn't unmute myself. I'm sorry. It was disabled, so. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for this uh, presentation. It was really inspirational for me. And um, I was wondering, um, since this like architecture appeals to um, human experiences, what um, contributions like did you made in terms of to like appeal to senses? Um, I guess you're on YouTube, uh, we can hear you. Can you uh, hear me? 
Yeah, there we sorry. Go. We were muted. We were muted. <laughs> we were muted. Wait a second, that's okay. Okay, I, so the question was about the senses, right? Yeah. Would, mm -hmm. would you mind popping again the question, please? Because we wouldn't uh, listen to it. Um, so my question was, since like the architecture um, appeals to uh, human experiences, I was wondering uh, like if you did consider or you like did made any contributions like using to appeal to human senses. You want to take it? You want me to take Go it? Ahead. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, there are many different features within the designs that we're using to engage the senses. Um, actually, one of uh, the questions that we were discussing is on color and on the use of color. But I would say, I mean, the, the spaces are active. They're highly active. And so, I mean, of course, visually, when we're looking at them, we're seeing the color, we're seeing the texture. Um, where you are able to really actively feel, you know, you can touch the spaces and feel the difference uh, between the bihuko and between the very silky soft cement finish um, and engage with the plants. But there's also an element of sound that comes into play um, in these spaces, especially in the museums. Of course, the hotel is, is always very active because you have people coming in and out a lot. Um, you have folks bringing food, folks bringing drinks, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're in the museums, you get this very big sense of space, spaciousness around you and you can hear that. Um, you might be able to hear it through water moving through. You might be able to hear it through gentle music or the rustling of the trees and the leaves. But that's a big one that's coming into play for us. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. If you come to our restaurants, you can also enjoy the sense of taste. <laughs> <laughs> and try some of our goodies, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you Shil, for your question, and there's a question on chat. Uh, Nessius Lopez asks that, uh, can they talk about permitting process? Uh, how can one work with these outside of the builder owner setting? It's a good question. Perhaps. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, we're, we're in the middle of the jungle, in a place um, where to be able to construct uh, these systems, it, it was easy for us uh, because uh, in the town uh, of Tulum, uh, being, a, being, being a small town, uh, the legislations um, are not too strict with the construction. So the information that they ask is um, kind of basic. So that led us be, to deliver. Now in these days we're having international projects that uh, get us to be giving more information, more technical information. And uh, it doesn't matter about, it doesn't mind the design uh, or the constructive system or the shape of the form. You're always uh, able to, to achieve what the law is asking you to deliver. It's just about the finding the proper solutions uh, to be able to express them. Absolutely. I would say that with the, um, the increase in our global presence that's occurring right now, it's actually pushing us to advance some of our internal processes yeah. uh, in the company, which is great. It's absolutely an opportunity. And I would advise that in general, collectively, we don't view international permitting or being in a different site as a restriction. I would say that we should always view the opportunities as, you know, a design totally. opportunity. Yeah, and view it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question and answer. Uh, Kutai has a question, it seems. Hi, uh, hello. Can you hear me? First yes. Day? Okay. Uh, so, uh, my question is kind of go two-parter. Uh, first of all, I when I look at your forms, I see uh, ivy like crawlers movements into the forest, like ivies crawl onto trees. And uh, you talk about adaptation of this uh, project. And I think that 
this project really adapt to the jungle environment with even using concrete. And I want to say uh, this is really something remarkable. So uh, my question is that how did you manage to like maintain the, the borders of uh, different spaces? Because the spaces that you create is mostly like, as you said, we don't see uh, walls as walls and floors as floors. We see they are as continuation of spaces. So how did you maintain the like, how did you manage to uh, maintain the borders of different spaces, like private spaces, social spaces, and others? It's really, it's really a good observation that, that, you, that you do. Um, actually, it's something that we like to play, uh, play with it with the materials and the, and the forms. As you see, you discover the places. So for us, it's kind of a labyrinth. We decide uh, through the design where we want people to be able to arrive and where we don't want them to arrive. So through the design and how you put the program is one, so, is one solution. The second one is through elements. When you start to, to walk, for example, you're inside of the museum and you're going to pass to another space, you will have a different texture in the floor that when you cross it, you feel and you know you're passing to another element. If you're in the exterior, you're walking in a, let's say in a common, in a common path, you're gonna be walking in a, in, a, in a floor made of gravel. But you, when you start to cross by to get into a private space, we change it to be sand. So when you start to walk in the sand, you feel the difference. And through that barrier, you don't need to have a solid barrier that is blocking you or putting you a, a, a tag that says, now you're passing to another space. Through the sensations, you change it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kutai, for the question. And there is a question on the chat. Uh, Bahadur Erenkapte asks that, uh, how do you guys feel when you get in the somewhere that you built? Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah. Uh, how do you guys feel when you get in the somewhere that you built? Where we go into a place that we've built. Yeah. Ah, that's a great question. Um, man, it's, 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 shock, it's shockingly beautiful every time. Oh, because it doesn't matter the time uh, that passed by. You're always finding a different uh, perspective, a different angle because of the organic uh, elements. So when you walk again and you have to take the shoes to get inside of the museum, it's something really, really nice because you understand that you're passing to a place that is kind of um, give a respect to, to the place, to the nature itself. Yeah. So walking around nature and, uh, and being outside and then getting in and walking around the museum and outside it's something that is um, that is really um, how you say um, that you feel good about it. Yeah, yeah, and always finding a new corner. You don't get you don't get exhausted of, of getting in continuously. In my perspective, I don't know what what deal is. Yeah, uh, no, I feel similarly. I uh, when I'm in these spaces, I always feel like I'm seeing something that still looks new or that I haven't seen before. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's just like the trees are moving differently or the light looks different in that moment. Um, but I would say that coming from like a more uh, standardized architectural background that for me, whenever I'm in these spaces, I'm always feeling really inspired and they feel very freeing for me. They feel super freeing. And that is something that absolutely doesn't always happen when I'm inside of a building. You know, I could walk into one building to go to an appointment somewhere or go into another building to file some paperwork, you know, whatever it is in a dense urban space. But when I'm in these spaces here in this area, it's a completely and totally uh, different sensation. And the words that are coming to mind are, freeing and liberating, yes. inspirational. I feel a tremendous amount of creativity. Sure. Like it actively makes me want to be designing um, when I'm in these spaces. There's such a playful element um, that naturally 
comes when you're there. And I know Fernando mentioned this earlier, but I think there is the risk that as we get older, we might not play as much um, or be as creative. We might get a little bit more stuck in our path and our, our patterns. Uh, and these spaces help, um, help to push us out of them. They definitely do that for me. Okay, thank you for the answer. Uh, Sadiq, you can ask your question. Thanks for the joyful uh, conversation and the presentation. Well, uh, I wonder if you have any alternative material in, instead of concrete in order to create any uh, sustainable or environmental friendly uh, space. Actually, you used too much local and uh, local and environmental friendly uh, materials, but the concrete is another point of view. So I just wonder, is there any alternative for that uh, shapes, let's say? Thank you. Yeah, both concrete and steel are um, what I would call a double-edged sword. You know, they offer us a lot of benefit in terms of structural strength, um, capacity to enclose. We understand them relatively well in terms of their predictability, you know, how they're going to yeah. work, how they're going to act. Um, we, it should be noted that, and I know you guys saw these in the images, but we're working with a ferro cement application, which changes the level of strength that the pieces themselves can have. So I would say first and foremost, overall, we're probably utilizing less cement on average than what you would see in these types of projects through this type of application. So always reduce. This is like number one fundamental principle when it comes to um, respecting ecology and trying to lower our carbon footprint. So reduction of material usage first and foremost. Um, thinking through how you can utilize different materials within your cement mixture to offset the really negative limestone clinker. I, I'm sure that you've all had your sustainability class for sustainable design, environmental design, um, but the biggest issue behind concrete is actually the cement and it's the process of heating up your limestone that has a very negative effect and it has a very big carbon impact. So if we can consider alternatives for the amount of cement that's utilized, that'll help us all the most, like collectively across the board, anywhere that you're living in the world, through any architectural application if you're using concrete. So part of what we're doing here right now is we're looking at recyclability of materials. Uh, there are different fibers that you can mix into your concrete um, and your cementitious mixtures to make them actually a little bit more bouncy yeah. and to also make it possible to utilize less cement. Um, and then we're also looking at full materiality life cycle in terms of working mm -hmm. with specific companies uh, that are utilizing processes to offset their carbon impact. And that's huge for us right now. So yeah, that's the lens that we're working in in yeah. this moment. Um, but then there are also there are all different ways to be thinking about alternatives. Yeah, and as well we we are um, continuously exploring and searching different materials yeah. and doing some uh, um, research here on, on our uh, home uh, within the idea of exploring different possibilities using uh, some uh, natural fibers, um, some different uh, uh, natural materials as. Uh, yeah, clay as well, mm -hmm. um, to start to explore where we can get it, exactly. uh, to what level, so, yeah. Exactly, and it should be noted that each site that you work on is different. Like, fundamentally, sure. the most sustainable thing that you can do is make sure that you're working contextually. So here in Tulum, we're working with the materials that we have here on site, uh, plus our cement alternatives, right? If we were working in a different site, uh, maybe we're somewhere in Europe, maybe we're somewhere in the Middle East, maybe we might be in Africa, you know, we could be anywhere, right? But we're going to want to understand contextually where we are and then really work with that material palette. Exactly. Yeah. That's a really good answer. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I thank you for the, this detailed answer and for the question, Sadr. And Aishana uh, has a question. Thank you for your inspirational presentation. I wanted to ask what boosts your creativity in your daily life as designers? Oh, <laughs> these questions are so good. <laughs> you want to get that shit? What? Okay, sure, 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 sure. I'll think on the spot with this one. What boosts my creativity in my daily life? For me, it's actually movement. I love okay. movement practices. Um, I love to be running, be exercising, be in the out of doors, uh, but I especially love yoga and dance. Those for me have been foundational uh, in my life for as long as I can remember, <laughs> since I was very, very little. Um, meditation is super important. I know that we can talk about meditation in like a more kind of fluffy, airy way, but to actually be able to sit down and meditate for 10, 15 minutes a day can be life-changing. And it can help us to be way more efficient and highly functional and calm in our yeah. work. And that's been super helpful for me, um, sure. boosting my creativity for sure. Yeah. On my on my end, I would say being around nature. It doesn't matter what type of of, of element you are, but be, being around her. <laughs> if you go out to have a walk in the woods, when you walk in the woods without headphones and you're listening the natural sounds the branches, how the, the, the air hits the, the canopy of the trees, uh, you touch the tree and you just go through with nature, creativity just comes easily to you because you are open to understand and to, and to listen what nature wants to express through you. We are in the jungle. I love to walk in the jungle. I love to go to the beach to get inside of the inside of the sea. And when I get inside of the water, I don't think I start to feel the water. I start I start to to be grateful with the nature, the sea, uh, that it's giving me these sensations. And I would say that for me, that is what boosts me totally my creativity, being respectful with nature and around it. Since I since since I have memory. I remember being in the woods with my with my father and going around the, uh, horses and um, and that sensation, that feeling, uh, it's always making me feel free to 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 create whatever whatever my mind feels it's uh, what wants to express it, and then just having the hand to express it or even a conversation. It doesn't matter how you want to, to share it, but sharing those crazy ideas, then you think how to solve them technically. Yeah. But first, <laughs> let's ground them. It's like, why we have to stop about uh, thinking that we like to build something on top of a tree? You would say, no, but you have to think in structure. Yeah, later. First, let's have <laughs> the beautiful dream of how, how we want to be on top of the tree. <laughs> and then you start to get into the technical parts of solving it. But first, let's dream about it. So I would say nature is my, 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 my answer. Thank you very much. Thank you for the answer. And there is one question from chat. Uh, it says, how does this unique production method differ according to the function in each project? For example, in creating the atmosphere of a museum or creating the atmosphere of a residence? Nice question. Oh, that's that's a nice question. That's a good one. That's a good one. I feel like that probably actually um, touches on a lot of the work that we're doing right now. Definitely. That we're actively doing. Um, like, as I, I mentioned before, our firm has been growing over the years. Um, when Azulik was built, Roth Architecture didn't exist. Uh, Roth Architecture as a business is relatively new to the table. Um, and the projects that the project requests that have been coming in, um, some of them are overlapping, but typically they're each pretty unique. And so part of our design process in-house um, is to work with our designers and our project architects here to really start to lay out spatial requirements, programmatic requirements, um, and not only you know, 
place places, but think about how we move from one place to the other, what the sequence of movement is, um, and then start to differentiate the feel or the vibe um, of each of those spaces. I know both feel and vibe are chen, like they're words that are used a lot, but if we're thinking interior design, for example, we might have a lookbook for each of our spaces yeah. that's like a look and feel um, palette for what we want that space to be like. So there's both a programmatic functioning that actually needs to happen and occur in that space, but then there's also this colorful, mm -hmm. textural, it might be uh, differentiation through sound um, or lighting. A lot of times we're differentiating through amount of light that's yes. coming into certain spaces and then also need for enclosure versus no enclosure. Some of our spaces are completely climate controlled, but many of them are not. Many of them are not. And that's that helps us in a number of ways. I mean, it's helping in terms of reducing energy mm -hmm. usage efficiency. and efficiencies, but then it's also helping us to blend that interior, exterior, and you know, bridge that dichotomy and not get caught in that world. Um, a little bit of a long answer. No, no, good. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's really you nailed it. Well, thank you for the questions and these wonderful answers. Uh, is there any question? Uh, one last question, maybe. So I believe there are no further questions. So we can slowly close the session. But before it, uh, we want to take some screenshots uh, and combine them to post on our social media accounts and for our society's archives. So if everyone can open their webcams, we can take a Zoom photo. It's good to see faces. See, it's, nice. <laughs> it's nice to put a face on the names. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we are done for the photo. <laughs> Thank you for your oh, opening of no, cameras. <laughs> 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 So, dear Elizabeth and Fernando, thank you so much for this wonderful evening and a morning for you, uh, for joining us from Tulum. It was an honor to host you here via Zoom, and we hope in the near future we will meet you in person as well, along with our face-to-face uh, -face events, hopefully. Uh, also, thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. It was a very inspiring and joyful event, uh, and as design students, I believe we uh, gathered lots of new information and these will enhance our perspectives about architecture, design, those new materials and their selection and use, and as well as the behind the scenes of these wonderful projects. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, is there anything you want to add, Mirai and Onur, our co-coordinators for this event? Yes, I will. Oh, sorry. Someone was going to speak. Sorry, Sorry, I was going to thank you. Uh, I was going to uh, thank you and that's all. Okay. Just to close on my end, if, if, uh, if you agree, I just would like to, first of all, thank everybody to, to being here with us. Um, and second, I just would like to tell you guys that um, you're the next generation that is coming to truly make the difference in this world. And it's an amazing opportunity to stop doing what we see that is not working anymore. It's a moment where the expression through how we live and how we want to people live in the future can be expressed. So I would say that uh, it's important that you enjoy and play with it. Let, go outside of the box of the normal thinking that normally the structures of the schools, with all due respect, uh, mm -hmm. teach us. And let your creativity to flow and design stuff that you don't think how you're going to solve it, but later you will find the solutions. Don't stay with the normal word that they say that it's not possible. Everything is possible. 
me personally on my own, arriving to this place, I saw that the limits are the ones that we decide to put ourselves. There are no boundaries. The boundaries are the ones that we mentally do to ourselves. So with this, I would say, guys, don't, don't, don't put boundaries to you and continually. And if you feel it's something that is not achievable, think, think twice and see that everything that you can dream, you can build it. Okay. This, this is where I, I end up talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And there is one audience, uh, dear Nessie Lopez, uh, you want to talk, I guess, you raise your hand. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask if if we go visit in Tulum, how we can reach out and maybe connect. Definitely. Uh, well, uh, over here the museum is open to the public, and uh, when you arrive, uh, if you're coming to, if you're going to to Tulum over there, there's a museum, and if you come to Umay, uh here in the in the jungle, the museum. Any, any of you guys that uh, listen this and came just in the, with the security, tell them that you were in a conversation with us and they will uh, contact us to, to meet in person with you guys. We can give you a tour. Yeah. Awesome. Gracias. De nada. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Bye guys. Bye. Thank you again. Enjoy life. Thank <laughs> you.